All right, so let's talk about a couple of these traditional approaches to fisheries management. Um, gear restrictions is pretty obvious. This is choosing uh, a, a net size that is of different diameter. Uh, this is choosing um, objects that interact with the bottom differently. This is choosing hooks that have different shapes to them that, that, that won't or generally speaking, that won't hook certain critters, or if they, they, they hook some, they're able to get off of the hook more easily than, say, a traditional barbed hook, something like that. So gear restrictions are pretty obvious. Um, this is the one we should spend a little bit of time on. This is the uh, most important one to make sure that you guys get and is maybe something you haven't talked about in some of your previous classes. This is this notion of maximum sustainable yield Again, most typically referred to as sim simply as MSY. So have you guys talked about this in any of your other classes? So which classes? Okay, so tell, so tell us, give us the once over about MSY. Right, so this really started in the 50s. And this is very much so a mathematical approach to, you know, very crisp, very, very, of course, we have the equation, so of course it'll work, right? I mean, please, we're so smart, right? We can outsmart nature type of thing. Um, what do I want to say about this? Uh, So this is really the, okay, so let's have a look at this. So we have, here's our, here's our, um, our conditions here assume stability. Our conditions here assume that we have some given carrying capacity of the habitat. Let's say we can, we can support as many as 100 tuna. And so therefore, if we have 100 tuna and we take um, one tuna away, right? If you and I catch one tuna, uh, oh, let me step back. This is all based on the notion that you and I should be taking these resources, right? So it's the idea, what's the maximum we can take that would lead to the greatest amount of reproduction or, or, or we can think of the replacement of that population and that economically, that's, that's the desirous condition. So have a look at that. So if we look at the uh, number of fish in our theoretical population on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, the greatest, now if we, if we harvested at, uh, if we scroll up from that 20-year uh, target, the amount of additional productivity, the amount of additional fish we're adding is relatively f flat, right? As we go to 21 years, the, the rate of addition of those critters into the population is going up, right? The derivative is, is, is getting bigger, right? This is calculus. I said, like, why do we need no calculus the other day? I said, so you can calculate MSY. And he's like, what the hell is MSY? And I said, shut up. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, so right, so we're going there. So the, the, the greatest return is at that inflection point, right? right. Once we go past that inflection point, of course, we're still adding to the population, but the amount of additional addition is declining, right? The derivative isn't the same. So that's, that's the peak. That's the quote unquote most efficient in the economist's way of looking at this. And so that's where this came from. So the idea, so, so and, then, and, then, and then what are the possible downsides of this approach? Well, we know the downsides, it leads to overfishing, but, but why does it lead? Or how can it lead to problems? So, so overestimate. Why is it? A, why does it lead to overestimate? What can we do? Stochasticity, environmental variation. So, there's no such thing as a carrying capacity. Right. Again, invented by economists that maybe didn't fully understand, or mathematicians that maybe didn't understand how the natural world works, right? Maybe that's normally good. And then we have a whatever rainy year this year, and 
and so that that rain fl no, well, I wasn't attacking rain either. I, I didn't mean that. But I meant, but but a a a high precipitation year. Maybe I'll say it that way. A high precipitation year, right? Which drives all this rain in the estuary, which changes the nutrient load, which changes the potential forage for these fish. So then this year, the carrying capacity is different than when we measured it last year. Just like we have the challenge, all the challenges that you guys identified for data deficient uh, fisheries, going out and counting the how many critters there are, it's a gazillion times more complicated to try to articulate the habitat, right? To look at all the temperature variation, look at all the nooks and crannies where the fish can hide in, look at how frequently they encounter mates, that's a much more complicated thing. So assuming we were somehow able to magically figure out what the real carrying capacity is, year one, we're almost assuredly not going to go back in year two or year three and track that variation, right? So we're almost setting ourselves up for failure, right? The economists would look at that and they'd say, oh my god, if we set the number too low, they would say, we're not being as efficient as we possibly can. Let's take more, let's take more. So there's always this push to take a little more. Take a little more, right? And the problem is, as you guys saw with fish banks, once you tip the scale, it, it, rapidly, it rapidly changes, although we don't get that signal for a while because, again, we're not looking at the actual, we're not looking at the real population curve. We're looking at our harvest, our landing rates. So the main problem with this is that the environment is fluctuating, but we get fooled into, by the elegance of the math, we get fooled into thinking that this is, this is the end all be all. So most of the efforts to modify MSY have come with the idea of trying to introduce this stochasticity, trying to introduce correlates of the environmental variation that would, that would induce a reduced level of harvest, say, this year. Um, but, and you can see some of these stories on Scoop It, uh, just like we saw the problem with the um, flood insurance, right? When we say, oh my gosh, these houses are in flood zone, people push back. So when we, if we've had a, a harvest, a target harvest rate, a quota of X, and then you and I are like, oh, whoa, dude, whoa, 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 whoa. It's a whatever year. We got to have that, right? There's going to be pushback. Right, there's gonna be a lot of pushback, so, so it's 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 like gas prices. It's very easy to drive them up. It takes a lot lot longer for them to come back down because of all because of various uh, human sociological pressures and stuff. Okay, so that's that's the so-called MSY curve or maximum sustainable yield curve. Um, oh, so okay. The other thing this builds. Sorry. So one is the stochasticity. The other thing about this is there's zero insurance. So this is all based on balancing on the head of a pin, right? Precisely. Super. This is the right thing. And that is a dangerous thing in our in the natural world, right? Physics they can do that because physics is super easy, right? <laughs> Ecological systems much more complicated. So right here, there is no built-in insurance. And in fact, the economists that invented this would argue against the insurance because they see that as waste. So the insurance, the insurance would be harvest lower down, right? Take fewer guys out of the system. And that's, that's viewed economically as, as inefficient, right? It's not maximum yield. So there's a couple, and there's other problems with this as well. But the two biggest ones are environmental stochasticity and the lack of padding um, and the lack of a conservative approach, what we might call a precautionary principle to managing the resource with this approach. And like everything, the assumption of perfect knowledge. Okay, closures are really obvious. You guys know what this is. It just means we set up an area and say you can't go and take stuff out of here. We'll be talking more about cl closures um, uh, when we talk about marine protected areas. But suffice it to say, closures can be very powerful. And, uh, it's, and if we have not nuked the system, if we've not knocked the system into an alternative stable state, 
these things are life forms, right? They will reproduce if they have the right nutrients, if they have the right habitat, if they have the right water, whatever. So the idea here is if we haven't gone too far down the rabbit hole, if we just stop our negative pressure, the population hopefully will be able to self-recover. That's the philosophy behind closures, or what we might call protected areas, or what we might call, if they're in the ocean or touch the ocean, marine protected areas, or MPAs. Another, another a class of important, so those are stuff I've shown you before. These are all policy things. These, these all come from the, the, the regulatory body, the, the group of fishermen, whatever. This, these next uh, sets of solutions, uh, more and more people are working on these all the time. A lot of our colleagues uh, nearby here spend a lot of time trying to think about these and vet these things. But a whole host of market-based solutions, after we finish our polls, we'll be doing an investigation of one of these types of approaches. But one is certification. So when we do our, our market surveys, our, our, our point of sale surveys, one of the things we'll be looking at is, uh, is this seafood uh, certified? Is it, is, it, is it certified to come from an area that's sustainably managed, that's more responsibly managed? Um, and uh, that, that also, in, in the case of the stuff we look at, is looking at consumer-based things. You guys being more empowered to make more informed decisions as to your buying and to choose to reward with your dollars the folks that are doing more responsible harvest methods and approaches versus folks that are being um, irresponsible. Another, a broad category is, as we mentioned before, this notion of privatization or, or trying to limit access by giving private control. And so in many cases, we've historically grown up, say in the US, of allowing everybody into the fishery. Maybe we need to restrict that. And so in recent decades, we've, we've worked on restricting access to uh, that, that fishing ground or that fishing st that f stock. But they're already out there. So one of the approaches a lot of environmental groups have taken is to raise money and then they go and they buy the fishing rights and then they don't fish. They don't, they don't exploit those rights, right? So that's essentially reducing effort by, um, by not exercising their exploitative rights. That's one approach. Uh, you get, as you guys, uh, as we touched on before, again, we'll touch more on this uh, later, but this notion of aquaculture. So we'll go and, and we'll grow our own fish outside of the ocean or, or maybe in the ocean in pens, but outside of the wild, uh, you know, was, this is more like farming rather than hunting. And so that, that is, as we mentioned before, the main way we've been able to, to increase our our marine or coastal derived proteins. This notion of so-called underutilized species. So the, the state of California, as crazy it is, produces a top 10 list, the 10 most underutilized species in state waters. Are you killing me? Are you, I'm killing me. Are you killing me? Sorry. That's a wrong. That was a Freudian slip or something. But um, one of the organisms I studied for my PhD, which was a snail, which the name has changed. It changes every couple of years because some silly geneticist decides to do a master's thesis and says, oh, it's a different species. But anyway, but the thing that I studied that used to be called Lithopoma undiosa, um, which is a snail, wavy top snail, a big snail, um, that you know, they can be really big. They can be the size of maybe two of my fists. They can be big honking things. They move very slowly, right? They might take decades to get that big, very slow growing. They don't, they can't run away very fast. Those are one of the ones that the state of California said, hey, these are underutilized, right? Merry Christmas. Go harvest the hell out of these things. Recipe for destruction, shall we say? And then we can, um, simply reduce some of these perverse incentives, right? We can reduce some of the incentives to, uh, to underwrite insurance, to, to somehow provide other subsidies to encourage fishing. Um, Why don't they put money on snake heads and get people 
So Steve's question is, what about these, these invasive species or these non-desirous species? What if we just put incentives to harvest those things? And the answer is, we could do that. We have done that with things like Nutria in Louisiana and other, uh, other critters. Um, I don't... Does that create a market? It's, so it's a good question. Those haven't really worked for reasons that aren't, that aren't entirely clear. Um, one, a lot of times because these, these critters have a, if these things were super tasty and mm, 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 they, you wouldn't need to put an economic incentive. People would just go take them out, right? But when they have things like snakeheads or, or we'll see an example of this in a second, but, 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 but the money thing doesn't always counteract it. You, it seems like you need to use something different. I'll show you something different in a second. But, but just purely putting that money into incentivizing the reduction of critters, that really works with mountain lions, that really worked with coyotes and stuff, but it doesn't seem to work as well with our, with our invasive species. But, um, but maybe you guys can figure it out, but that's a great idea. That's a wonderful uh, suggestion for improving stuff. Okay, real quickly here, we'll talk more about this later, but this notion of uh, consumer-based solutions, we'll use Seafood Watch, which is a third-party certification or a green guide, they're, they're related. And essentially is trying to empower the consumer with information to drive them to, more, to consume more sustainably harvested fish stocks and to disincentivize the purchase of things that are, are, are poorly managed or not well uh, managed. Again, we mentioned this before, you could just go out and buy the, buy the rights to fish 100 tuna and, and then just not fish them. Uh, we can culture fish, we'll talk more about that later. And uh, so here's this notion of underutilized species. The industry has really utilized this approach. So firstly, what you do is you get rid of the icky word because people don't like evil, uh, uh, icky words. Silver hake, people don't like that. Whiting. Slime heads, don't call them slime heads, let's call them orange roughy. That sounds so much nicer. And then the waiter will say, oh, it's a nice white fish. It, it's very delicate, it's just, it's just wonderful. And then people are like, okay. There's something, as you guys will learn when we get into the, the next module of doing our seafood surveys, there's something that is a bit unique about fish and that we typically, in our modern society, we don't buy the whole fish. We buy filleted fish. So it's a lot harder, even for we experts, to look at that and go, oh, that's, uh, what is that? I don't know, it's pink, <laughs> but I don't know what it is. So it's, it's much easier, okay, compared to vegetables. If I give you a vegetable, you'd know what the, you, at least if you were paying attention, you could tell that's kale. That's a radish, right? It's, it's kind of hard to tell someone this is a carrot when it's a radish, right? You're like, dude, no, it's not. It would be the equivalent of, a, of giving you little teeny tiny pieces of lettuce that's just a little square of green and go, here you go. It, you still would probably be able to tell, but, but it'd be much harder, right? That's what goes on with, with fish. So it's, it's hard. So when you get something, people call it, oh, it's roughy. Oh my God, it's so delicious. Right? Patagonian toothfish? What? Let's call it Chilean sea bass. That sounds so much better, right? Ooh, sea bass. I love that. So, so uh, my family, whenever we go out, because you'll be, well, you won't maybe become like me, but you'll ask the questions that I ask. I go, they go, oh, we got this wonderful bass. Bass? What kind of bass is that? Excuse me? What kind of bass is that? Oh, it's sea bass. No, no. Thank you. No, what kind of sea bass? Uh, it's a sea bass from the ocean, right? Like, so is this white sea bass from California? Is it? Oh, I don't know. Let me let me check with the, the chef, like you know. And then they're like, I'm gonna get the hell out of this table, right? So, so that notion of 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 accepting that it's fine to throw out some word and that people are not discriminating, is part of the problem. The lack of consumer pressure. To, to have that knowledge is part of the problem. And we've just, we've just grown up and we're used to that. We could, you know, and again, we don't call it anglerfish, we call it you know, monkfish and all these things, all these different, these different sanitized terms go on and on and on. 
Another broad approach is this so-called, um, what you'll hear referred to as EBM, ecosystem-based management. That's an alternative to MSY type approaches or single species-based management. Ecosystem-based management takes as its, as its goal a healthy ecosystem, an entire community. So fish are part of that, but so is the, so is the benthos, so is the, the overall functioning of the system as a whole, et cetera. And so this is a buzzword that a lot of people will use and sometimes doesn't actually have any teeth to it, but conceptually it makes more sense, right? Let's, let's manage for the whole of the system as opposed to one little component of the system. And so uh, in, in idealized ecosystem-based management, will it gives us the ability to reduce bycatch because we're managing for all the critters that are taken out of the system, not just, not just species A. Um, one of the approaches that's very popular are to, are to use spatial closures or spatially explicit reduction in pressure, uh, marine reserves or marine protected areas. This can induce a catch share program, or this can, one of the facets of ecosystem based management can be catch share programs. So we all agree that, hey, we're, we're all going to go out and, and fish for this fish, but, but if I get too much, you know, instead of you getting nothing and I getting twice as much, we can do some type of, of, uh, of pooling of resources, sharing of the catch. And people have talked about this other approach, the so called ESY or ecological sustainable yield or ecologically sustainable yield and that that's sort of just a different codification of this notion of ecosystem-based management. 